Welcome everyone. We are so happy you're able to join us today. Today we have some very important topics. Distracted driving is going to be the focus of this webinar, which is one of the five leading contributing factors to fatal and serious injury crashes on our roadways here in Louisiana. And I have no doubt nationally as well. We are beyond ecstatic and grateful to have some of the state's leading subject matter experts serving as our panelists today, and we'll introduce each of them to you before they begin their presentation. But before we kick off, let me introduce myself. My name is Amber Asler, and I will be serving as the webinar moderator today. A little background on myself, I'm the Regional Transportation Safety Coordinator for the Southwest Louisiana Regional Safety Coalition. I've been promoting transportation safety with DVD initiatives through the Louisiana Strategic Highway Safety Plan, which you'll hear us refer to as the SHSP, in the Southwest region for the last three years. I've been certified as a child passenger safety seat technician and co-developer of the performance action compliance tracking system that we call PACT. The state of Louisiana and all nine regions use this to implement, analyze, and refine our annual transportation safety plan. Before um, I entered the public transportation field, I worked as the flight ops quality assurance manager for an international oil and gas helicopter company. During this time, I also served as a steering committee chair on various rotor wing flight data monitoring groups. I am crazy passionate about transportation safety, whether it's in the air or on the ground. All right, so now to the meat of it all. I am going to introduce the wizard or the woman behind the curtain of this whole shindig. Destiny Kinefsky is our technical director. She is the transportation safety planner with the Rapids Area Planning Commission in Alexandria, as well as the coordinator for the Central Louisiana Highway Safety Coalition. She is our webinar technical director, as I have mentioned, and she has been spectacular and invaluable in the development and execution of today's webinar. It took tons of planning, but we are so pleased with the outcome. She's been promoting transportation safety for the Louisiana SHSP and Destination Zero Death, DVD, throughout 10 parishes in the central region for the last two years. Before entering the transportation field, she worked as the outreach coordinator as well as a program tech for the Rapids Parish Service Center of the USDA Farm Service Agency. Destiny is also a certified child passenger safety tech and member of the Louisiana Passenger Safety Task Force. All right, everyone, now that you know a little bit about the two of us, we want to find out a little something about each of you. If you could take about five seconds to answer our first poll question of the day, we would definitely appreciate it. All right, five more seconds, guys. Just let us know where you're from. Wow, this is awesome to see attendees from across our great state. I hope everyone is ready. It's time to dive in today, to, into today's agenda. But before we get going, I want to tell you just a little bit about what we do, why we do it. And I want to, let's see, I'm sorry. I want to look at the things we do at DVD. I'm going to begin by briefing you on the driving force that has paved the pathway on how and what and why it is we do what we do. Louisiana is on a mission. We're on a mission to create a highway safety culture where everyone sees one death as one too many. The Louisiana Department of Transportation in partnership with the Louisiana Highway Safety Commission, Louisiana State Police, and other key safety partners from across the state decided it was time to unite regions, communities, and agencies from across the state to co collaborate on a fused mission to reduce death and injury on our roadways. From here, this is where that SHSP I had mentioned before was finally created. So this 
plan that was created, the SHSB, guides the state on how to continually lower the fatality and serious injuries that we see on our roadways on a daily basis, in part by using a regional approach and forming multidisciplinary safety coalitions in each region of our state. This is done to help identify and implement programs and activities that address the unique needs and concerns of our state's diverse areas. You know, in Louisiana, you see differences from street to street, from line to line. So you have to know that our transportation needs are very diverse. And that was a lot of the reasoning and behind creating these nine different coalitions. So the SHSP defined and established these nine safety coalitions. And closer to the conclusion of today's webinar, I'll show you just how to find out more information about the coalition nearest to you. So don't worry, but right now we're going to hop right back into it. All right, so each coalition that I've been talking about is led by a safety coordinator and community stakeholders primarily made up of rep representatives from one of what we like to call the four E's. So the four E's include engineering, enforcement, education, and emergency services. But I want you to take a second. Just like our LSU Tigers, and I know you have got to be familiar with Tiger football and the championship that we brought home last year, they often call for the 12th man on the field to lead them to victory every Saturday. And that 12th man is their fan. So our state calls for our fifth E, and that fifth E is everyone. We need everyone to get involved with our mission, and not just on Saturday, but every day. Because without each and every one of us doing our part, we're defeated before we even begin. So moving on from that ginormous responsibility I just tossed your way, I want to talk about goals and what they are. I'm a, day, a data geek, and I wholeheartedly believe if you're going to set a goal, it's got to be data driven. So let's talk data. But wait, don't freak out. I promise, promise, promise I'll be brief. All right, so here in a few minutes, you're going to hear our first panelist talk about several important, important things. And he's not just going to show you. He's going to change your thinking on the matter of distracted driving from being casual to focused and detrimental. So I'm going to set him up by telling you, distracted driving is dangerous. It is so very dangerous, more so than you think. It's become an acceptable social norm amongst all of us, but it is actually a deadly addiction. Nationally, in 2018 alone, Close to 3,000 lives were lost due to distracted driving. And close to 160 of those 3,000 American lives lost resided right here in Louisiana. Breaking down the national figures some more, close to 1,750 of those killed were drivers. A little bit over 600 passengers 400 simply pedestrians and 77 of that almost 3,000 lives lost were bicyclists. To me, that's pretty scary. But okay, I'm not going to shove data down your throat for much longer. Well, actually, I'm not going to do it anymore right now. I want to get a little bit of information from you. We were talking about goal setting. So help us out. If we were going to set a goal for our state based on some of the numbers that you just saw, what do you think would be an appropriate and a reasonable goal? We want to hear from you. So let's get our poll started. Wow. Okay, so we We've got about three seconds left on that poll, guys. But I'm, I'm loving what I'm seeing coming in. Okay, I'll have to tell you this is the first time I've ever seen this, and I am so beyond proud. 
but the majority of everyone said zero, a goal of zero. We had a small number. Let's see, I think 3%, 100 to 500, and another 3% on more than 500. So taking that and keeping that goal in mind for the state, let's switch it around. We're going to pull up another goal. What if you had to set that same goal for your family, loved ones, and friends? What would that goal be? How many of your family, loved ones, and friends would you want to see fatally killed or injured due to a distracted driving crash? Take about five seconds. Well, you know what, guys? I know that one would be easy for me. It would be a big, fat zero. Remember, I'm a data-driven stat geek. Think of it this way. If each and every one of us puts a goal of zero for distracted driving deaths or injuries for our family, friends, and loved ones, you add up all of those zeros and you take an average of all of our goals, and what do we have? we have a state goal of zero. We can't say it's not okay for some people to be killed or seriously injured in, an, in a distracted driving crash, but be okay with that same fate for others. So yes, Louisiana has set an aggressive goal, hence destination zero death. Whew. All right. It's time for me to introduce our first panelist because I know you have got to be kind of hearing, kind of tired, excuse me, of hearing my voice by now. So let's bring in Mr. Ron Whitaker. I am pleased to introduce him. Ron has had a 29 year career in law enforcement, which began with Baton Rouge City Police Department and included 28 years with the Louisiana State Police. He served as a troop commander at two LSB troops, Troop G in Bossier City and Troop L in Mandeville. He's a graduate of Northwestern University School of Police Staff and Command, and he is a crash reconstructionist. He has also been recognized as a traffic enforcement expert. Since retiring from Louisiana State Police, he has worked with the LADOT as a law enforcement expert. The federal government has recognized his position as a best practice and has recommended that other states create similar positions. Guys, this is amazing. He facilitates the traffic incident management training in Louisiana, and he teaches work zone safety for law enforcement officers and helps improve crash data quality in Louisiana. He also, assists with the, he also assisted with the implementation of the Louisiana Strategic Highway Safety Plan, that SHSP. He helped establish many of the regional safety coalitions and currently serves as the co-chair of the statewide Distracted Driving Emphasis Area Team. Welcome, Mr. Ron Whitaker. And we'd like to turn our screen over to you All right, uh, thank you, Amber, for that introduction. I just wanna mention uh, Jessica Bedwell of the Louisiana Highway Safety Commission is my co-chair on the Distracted Driving Emphasis Area team. Uh, I certainly wouldn't be able to do this without her. I'm excited for the opportunity to talk to you guys today about distracted driving. And I wanna thank everyone who has joined us. I really appreciate you guys being here. So I've been asked to talk to you about uh, distracted driving. I've been asked to define distracted driving, talk about the extent of the problem, and suggest some countermeasures that would help address the problem. So, let's get started with a couple of poll questions. Have you ever been in a crash or near crash because the driver, you or another driver, was distracted by something inside the vehicle, such as a cell phone? 
and we'll give you about five seconds for that. All right, Ed, and that's pretty consistent with what we've seen in the past. The majority of us have seen that. All right, let's go to the next poll question. So when you're driving, when you're out on the road, do you worry about distracted drivers? And again, we'll give you about five seconds for that. <laughs> there you go. That, that tells you that uh, we at least perceive distracted driving as a, as a very real problem. All right, let's take a look at a, a distracted driving a distracted driving crash, see what that looks like. I mean, that's pretty scary, right? The driver took no evasive action, no braking, no steering. So absent impaired driving or some medical condition, we can assume that, that this driver was not paying attention to the task of driving. All right, let's look at the definition of distracted driving. And whether we're talking about distracted driving or distraction in general, most experts agree there are three forms of distraction. Manual, you're engaged in some physical activity, such as texting or dialing a phone, or probing, programming a, a navigation system in a car, or it could be something like eating or shaving or putting on makeup. Visual, where you're reading something or looking at something or someone inside or outside the vehicle. And then cognitive, which is synonymous with inattention. And that's thinking about something, uh, an argument with your wife or some difficult problem, or it could simply be letting your mind wander. And we've all done that. I mean, think about it. We've all been driving down the road, looked up and realized that we missed our exit or missed our turn or gone through an intersection without stopping. Now, one of these distractions is bad enough, but where we really run into trouble is when they overlap. For example, sending a text involves all three forms of distraction. Manual, typing the text. Visual, reading a text or reading the message that you're typing. And cognitive, mentally composing the text. When you're doing all three of these things, you are not paying attention to the task of driving. It's impossible. There's a myth that humans can multitask, and it's just that, it's a myth. What we're actually doing is switching between tasks, sometimes very rapidly, but we're switching between tasks and we're not multitasking. So we looked at other states to see if we could find a good definition of distracted driving and we were gonna adopt, adopt their definition. Unfortunately, what we found at the time was most states like Louisiana didn't have a definition for distracted driving. So with these three types of distraction in mind, we came up with our own definition of distracted driving. A distracted driver is one who is actively engaged in any activity that diverts his or her attention away from the task of driving. The distraction could be manual, visual, or cognitive, and the distraction could be inside or outside the vehicle. That's a pretty succinct definition of distracted driving and probably one of the, one of the better definitions that you'll find. So let's take a look at some of the, the common distractions. Cell phones, certainly cell phones get all the media attention, right? but they're actually a subset of distracted driving. But let's talk about cell phone use for a minute. Talking on a cell phone can be very distracting. It always comes up, the question always comes up, which is safer, hands held or hands free? Well, research has shown that hands free can be just as cognitively distracting as hand held. Turns out it's not the act of holding or not holding the cell phone that determines the distraction. It's the depth of the conversation. For example, if your wife calls and asks you to pick up a loaf of bread, that's not very distracting. On the other hand, if you get into a heated argument 
with your significant other, that can be very distracting. So it's the depth of the conversation that determines how distracting it, it is. So people often ask, well, if that's the case, why push for hands-free legislation? And the answer is to be able to prevent, to prevent those other more dangerous activities, such as texting. Research shows it takes four seconds to send the average text. During that time at highway speeds, you travel about the length of a football field. Essentially, you're driving blind the length of a football field. That doubles your chances of being involved in a crash. And it's not just young drivers. Texting and driving doesn't drop off significantly until around age 45. So we all agree that, that talking, texting on the phone is dangerous and it increases your chances of, of being involved in a crash, which brings us to other. And as frightening as it is, as other drivers talking and texting on their phones, that's not half the problem, literally not half the problem. Research shows that young drivers uh, are doing other things on, on, their, on their phone. They're interacting on social media, they're watching videos, uh, movies, and they're playing video games more than half the time. Now, obviously, all of those things are, are more distracting than simply sending a text. But again, it's not just cell phone. Research shows that for young drivers, engaging with other young passengers is more distracting than talking on the phone. A young driver is twice as likely to be involved in a crash if there are two or more young drivers in the vehicle. If there are three or more young people in the vehicle, they're four times as likely to be involved in a crash. Some other distractions. In-car voice-activated technology. That's supposed to, me to make driving less distracting. And in theory, that's great. In reality, it just isn't the case. The voice, the voice recognition technology just isn't good enough yet. And unfortunately, Practice doesn't make perfect. I mean, think about it. How many times have you tried to dictate a message and the phone or, or mobile device just couldn't seem to understand what you were saying? Well, that's distracting, very distracting. In addition to that, some of the navigation systems are, are just complicated. I mean, think about it. How many of you guys, like me, have very expensive navigation system in our vehicle? but I use the map on my iPhone uh, for navigation. Now, the technology is getting better, but we still have a long way to go yet. And we see people doing these other things as well, reading, and we've all seen it, uh, seen people reading a book or, write, or riding down the road reading a newspaper, putting on makeup or shaving or eating. I've even seen people working on an Excel spreadsheet driving down the interstate at 75 miles an hour. All of these activities are distracting and they greatly increase our chances of being involved in a crash. So let's take a look at the extent of the, dra of the distracted driving problem uh, from a couple of different perspectives. We'll look at an attitudinal survey to see what drivers think about distracted driving. Next, we'll look at an observational survey conducted by Louisiana Highway Safety Commission to see what is actually happening. Then we'll look at some research that's been done. And lastly, we'll briefly look at some crash statistics. So let's take a look at driver attitude. According to research done by the Highway Safety Commission, half of the drivers who talk on their cell phone report no change in the quality and nature of their driving. And this one is, is shocking to me, but a third of those who admit that they text while drive report that their driving is unaffected by that distraction. But here's the thing, 65% of those same people support hands-free legislation. Well, think about that for a second. That tells us that there's a very real disconnect there. What it tells us is we think that we can engage in these activities and drive safely, but we worry about other drivers doing the exact same thing. So 
what did the observational survey show us? A little over a third of all drivers were engaged in at least one secondary activity. And the prevalence of any secondary task was higher when there were passengers in the vehicle, and that's as we would expect. It also showed that female drivers were more likely to engage in secondary tasks than male drivers. Looking at some of the research, NHTSA did a, a naturalistic uh, study. Now, a naturalistic study is where we put a, a video camera in the vehicle and then record the driver behavior. NHTSA looked at 100 vehicles over a one-year period. They found that 38% of the crashes were due to distraction or inattention. The Beanland crash study, again, a naturalistic study, they looked at 856 crashes where at least one occupant was admitted to the hospital they found that almost 40% of the crashes were due to distracted driving. And the problem is even more pronounced among young drivers. AAA did a study of young drivers and found that 60% of all crashes involve driver distraction. A naturalistic study by Charles Klein found that young drivers were distracted in 62% of the crashes or near crashes. Now that's a pretty significant difference. The significant difference for young drivers is probably due to two reasons. Number one, they have left less experience driving. So if they make a mistake, they may not be as able to recover, be able to recover as, as quickly as, as more experienced drivers. And the other thing, they're the age group that's most likely to engage in risky behavior, such as speeding. So, is distracted driving a highway safety problem? In Louisiana, over 30% of our fatal and serious injury crashes are due to distracted driving. And as you'll see in a minute, that, that number will go up. And that is in keeping with the observational surveys and the research we discussed earlier. Uh, additionally, nationally, uh, Nine people die and a thousand people are injured in the U.S. every day. But there's one very serious problem with these statistics, and that is this. These stats are just numbers. But each one of these numbers represents people, very real people. People have died or been seriously injured due to distracted driving. In addition to that, when we look at these stats, we know that distracted driving crashes are underreported. And there are a few reasons for that. Number one, for the most part, in a crash, distracted driving is a self-reported item, and it's not in the driver's best interest, to be honest. Number two, until last year, Louisiana did not define distracted driving for law enforcement officers. So we had many different definitions and standards. Since then, we've provided specific definitions for all driver conditions, including distracted driving. And third, the way the current crash report is structured has contributed to underreporting. The new crash report, which will be out in January of 2022, will be better structured to, to capture distracted driving info. So the conclusion, distracted driving is a very serious issue nationally and in Louisiana. It accounts for over a third of our serious injury and fatal crashes. Research, surveys, crash statistics, and our own observations as drivers confirm that there are a lot of distracted drivers on the road. So many so that, that we all worry about that. But again, there's a very real disconnect. We worry about what other drivers do but we think we can engage in those exact same behaviors and drive safe. So how can we improve this situation? Well, moving forward, company policy is one of the best things we can do. And it seems to be very effective in changing driver behavior. It's quicker and easier to implement for a company than it is to, to pass legislation. And it has immediate benefits to the employees, both on and off duty. Community Coffee has a great distracted driving policy. And Scott Fazio is going to tell you about that in a few minutes. You definitely want to stick around for his presentation. 
as a result of that program, they have a great safety record. Their insurance rates are lower and their drivers are safer. In addition to that, there's a residual effect. Companies with a strong distracted driving policy find that their drivers carry that behavior over into their personal driving habits. And their families tend to adopt those, those driving habits as well. That's one thing we can do. Another thing is hand-free legislation. And that's very important. Again, 65% of the people surveyed support that hands-free legislation. But that law must be written where law enforcement can enforce it. 24 states, DC, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the US Virgin Islands prohibit all drivers from using hands, uh, handheld cell phones while driving. And they're all primary enforcement laws. States that have implemented uh, hands-free laws have seen a reduction in crashes and as a result, a reduction in their insurance premium. Enforcement is a key. Research has shown that most people will comply with the law simply because it's the law. However, there are some people, and you know who you are, that need to know that that law will be enforced. Seatbelt law is a great example of that. Education. I don't want to wrap it up with this. How many of you have driven impaired or ridden with an impaired driver in the last month? I'm certain that's a very, very low number for two reasons. One, it's dangerous, right? We don't want to, we don't want to get in a crash. We're not going to ride with, with an impaired driver. But secondly, and this is important, it's no longer socially acceptable to drink and drive. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you have ridden with a distracted driver or driven distracted in the last month? Probably a lot more of you. The reality is the danger the danger is comparable to impaired driving. It significantly increases your chances of being involved in a crash. But we continue to do that. Why do we do that? One reason is it's socially acceptable. We have to change that. We have to change that through a combination of education and enforcement. And education is really going to be the key to changing these attitudes. And again, that's, that has to be our goal is to make it socially unacceptable much like we did with, with child safety things. Again, I want to thank everybody for being with us today. I want to thank the Regional Safety Coalition coordinators, our law enforcement officers, and our other safety partners. We appreciate everything you guys do. I also want to thank Amber and Destiny for uh, putting this webinar on. They put a lot of hard work into this, and I, I appreciate what you guys have done. Uh, I think we're gonna have some questions at the end, so I'll stick around, be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Okay, everyone, it's back to me again, sorry. But each and every one of you are so lucky to have heard this experienced, intelligent, driven, and effective leader speak today. Thank you so much, Ron. You have always brought to the table so much and we take as much as we can get and apply it to what we do every day. And one thing that you know really stuck with me is the comparison between distracted and impaired driving. I know myself, I'm not gonna get in the car with someone that I know has been drinking and I'm definitely not gonna get behind the wheel as I've been. So looking at the stats of it all and knowing that the results are close to the same, why in the world would I get in the car with someone who drops distracted or blew up myself? But yet I know I'm guilty of it. So you're absolutely right. We've got to change um, what we consider, consider socially acceptable. But thank you again so much, Ron. And everyone, just a quick announcement before we go on. Just like Ron said, we are going to address questions, but one way we would like to kind of collect them so we can just stay on time is if you do have questions as we're going, put them in the comment box um, on your account. And if you want it addressed by a specific panelist, whether it be Ron or Sergeant Anderson or Scott Fazio or 
tech director, Destiny, or myself, you can just put our names in there or at the panels. You can put number one, number two, number three, if it's easier on you. All right, so let's dive back in so I can close my mouth and let you know the, the important people speak. So now I have the honor of introducing Sergeant James Anderson. He is with the Louisiana State Police Group B, and I just have to take a brief, brief moment and brag on this man. He is the Southwest Louisiana Regional Safety Coalition Champion, and that's again line of coordinator, and he serves as the Occupant Protection Team Leader. His plate carries the weight of an entire buffet, but he attends to each and every parcel on that plate like it is, like it is his, I'm sorry, like it is his only charge. We are so very fortunate to have him in our region. Sergeant Anderson began his law enforcement career in 1991, becoming a Louisiana State Trooper in 1995. He served in patrol, protective services, the governor's security detail of that, internal affairs, and the Bureau of Investigation before transferring to public affairs in 2010. Anderson has been certified as a child passenger safety tech for over 10 years and serves as the Louisiana Passenger Safety Task Force Regional Coordinator for the Southwest Region in Louisiana. He also serves as President of the Board of Directors of Louisiana Operation Lifesaver and actively promotes highway safety through a combination of education, collaboration, and enforcement. And I can definitely attest to that. I know he is just amazing um, with everything he he does and puts his mind to. He has earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Criminal Justice with a concentration in Terrorism, Preparedness, and Security from Matthew State University. For the purpose of this webinar, he is our boots on the ground subject matter expert. Welcome, Sergeant Anderson. I'm going to hand the screen over to you if you'll just share your screen. Hey, thank you, Dusty. Uh, thank you, Amber. I appreciate that. Uh, appreciate everyone being here today, and I'll get this up in just a moment. All right. All right, so start with a video here. Wait, James, one second. We're not seeing your screen give us just a second okay everyone we apologize james will you try again to share your screen okay i sure will all right There we go. All right. Yeah, I just picked her up. We should be there in 20 minutes. Who is it? Oh, shit. All right. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm glad to be a part of it. Uh, I'm going to go over a little bit of what Ron just went over, but then we'll get into some uh, fresh material and uh, talk about the enforcement perspective of this as well. So to reiterate what Ron discussed, when we talk about the different types of distractions, uh, we talk about uh, visual, which is taking your eyes off the road. We talk about manual, which is taking your hands off the wheel. And we talk about cognitive, which is taking your mind off of what you're doing. And if you're texting and driving, in most cases, you're doing all three of these. And these definitely can be a problem behind the wheel. From a behavioral viewpoint, 
Serious or fatal crashes are caused by inattention or distraction, impairment, speed and aggression, fatigue, or a combination of these. You know, I, I've been to a lot of crash scenes in, in nearly 30 years in law enforcement, and uh, more times than not, it, it is a combination of these at, at play when it's a serious or fatal crash. And distracted driving, number one for the driving population as a whole. Uh, I will tell you, uh, excessive speed uh, for the younger drivers, that 15 to 24 demographic, excessive speed is the leading cause, but that, that's followed closely by distraction. And for the driving population as a whole, distracted driving is the biggest problem that we see uh, when it comes to crashes and what causes them. So here's a little video. It's, uh, it's a from a few years ago. I've got newer videos, but I, I really like this one. So I keep it in my catalog when I, I do in-person presentations. It just really does a good job of highlight, highlighting some of the consequences of texting and driving. Now we want to move on to an alarming warning about texting while driving. You know it's dangerous. Many people still continue to do it. And now there's some frightening new video that proves how bad it can be. Here's NBC's Janet Chandler. On a busy Texas interstate, traffic up ahead is at a dead stop. You can see it, but the driver of this San Antonio City bus speeding down the road clearly has something else occupying his attention. <laughs> Betty Jo Hummel was in the driver's seat of that SUV. <laughs> oh my God, that's bad. That's horrible. It was the most horrific thing I probably ever looked through. With two disabled passengers wrapped in behind him, why didn't the driver ever slow down? Take a look at what Adrian Perez was doing instead. He pulls out his cell phone. And starts texting. And that's just for a few seconds. For six minutes leading up to the crash, Perez was looking down. And when he finally focuses on the road, All right, so I, I think that video does a good job of, of illustrating the problem. But you know, we know that there are other distractions out there uh, besides use of a cell phone. Uh, Design Articles did, a, did a, a survey a few years ago and they looked at the top driving distractions out there. And we know that use of a mobile phone is number one, that's a given. But I want you to ask yourself, what do you think the second one is and what might that be? So here's a, uh, a poll question for you. Is it talking with passengers? Is it billboards? Or is it eating? Which of these is number two? Go ahead and uh, enter your answer and we'll have the results shortly. About three more seconds. All right, interesting. I uh, see uh, talking with passengers is the, uh, the, the top uh, guess on that. And I would have thought the same thing, and, and you're going to see it on this list. But uh, actually, if we look at uh, the uh, next one on here, 
It is actually eating. Uh, who knew eating could be so distracting? Yet it is. Uh, a few years ago, I was at an intersection. My light turned green, and I'm in the habit of looking before I go, and here comes an 18-wheeler right through the red light. Shoo, passes on through. Next color he sees is blue. As I'm writing him his ticket for running the red light, I ask him, sir, why did you run the red light? And he told me he was trying to get the last potato chip out of the bag. So I could have lost my life over a potato chip. So please keep that in mind. Keep that in mind when you're out there driving. Uh, there are people that will set aside their primary task, which is driving safely, to potentially get that last potato chip out of a bag. Number three, changing the radio. Uh, that indeed is a, uh, a distraction, especially nowadays where people use their cell phones to play music through. Uh, it's not like the, the older vehicles where you could turn a, a radio on a knob to hear some staticky station somewhere, um, but, but a lot more distracting. Number four, retri retrieving items from the back seat or floor. Uh, that's something that we see. You're taking your eyes off the road. You're taking your mind off of what you're doing. Uh, those are a couple of the, the distractions that we talked about, uh, Ron and I, and uh, that's certainly something uh, that we see in some of the crashes that we investigate. Uh, lighting a cigarette uh, can be uh, distracting. I think Scott has an excellent uh, video that illustrates that a little later. Uh, number six, talking with passengers. That was one of the, uh, the poll question uh, responses uh, that you could have, could have answered, and that, that is a distraction. As a matter of fact, that's why younger drivers are prohibited from having a bunch of, of people with them. Uh, number seven, shaving or applying makeup. I never thought of shaving as being that distracting. Uh, I, I can tell you I've been guilty of using an electric razor uh, while driving in the past. I uh, wasn't looking in the mirror. I was just passing it over my face and uh, just kind of feeling with my hand if I'd gotten everything. Um, but I was in a driving school, at a driving school a few years ago. A young lady in the, the back of the class raises her hand and says, I saw a, a woman shaving her legs the other day. And the girl next to her asked her, well, how was she doing that? And she said, well, she had her leg propped up on the dashboard and she's dipping her razor in a styrofoam cup. Well, I submit to you, not only is she driving distracted, but she's potentially also distracting the other drivers on the road. Number eight, billboards. Uh, we see billboards all over the place. Uh, we have electronic billboards uh, that are out there now. Uh, those are very distracting. The messages change every 10 seconds are designed to get your attention. So they can indeed be a, a distraction that can lead to a crash. Number nine, gawking at a crash, also known as rubbernecking. Oh, wow, I wonder what went on over there. Bam. Uh, I had a, an incident where a house got stuck on the Calcasieu River Bridge on US 171. They had uh, misestimated the amount of space that they needed to clear the railing and the house got stuck. And I literally watched in front of me, a car stopped to take a picture of this and a guy on a motorcycle who was so distracted looking at the house that he ran into the back of the car that it stopped to take a picture. So uh, both of those drivers were distracted and, and thankfully that motorcyclist wasn't seriously injured, but it, it could have turned out uh, very badly. Number 10, communicating with a known pedestrian. Uh, could be as simple as waving to a friend that you see on the side of the road. It's taking your focus off of your primary task, which is driving that vehicle safely. So we look at the effects of distractions, and the main ones that we see is that drivers react more slowly to traffic conditions or events outside of the vehicle, such as a car stopping or pulling out in front of you. Now, sometimes there, there are cases where uh, you just don't have time to react no matter what. But if you're paying attention, being a good defensive driver, then often you can avoid uh, events outside of the vehicle, thereby avoiding a crash. Drivers fail more often to recognize potential hazards such as pedestrians, bicyclists, or debris in the road. Uh, here in Calcasieu Parish, uh, we investigated yet another crash involving a pedestrian. Uh, in this case, though, the pedestrian was in the middle of a lane on a, on a dark road with no lighting. Uh, could it potentially have been that the pedestrian was, was distracted? Uh, maybe they were playing with their phone or not paying attention. 
But at any rate, uh, they were struck and killed uh, last night as a result. And I think the other public safety experts on this panel uh, will agree that we've seen a, a marked increase in the number of pedestrians and bicyclists uh, that have been injured and killed on our highways in the last few years. I'm uh, talking about debris on the road. Uh, I know our DOTD does a, a good job of going out there and getting it, uh, but sometimes things happen before they can get to it. Uh, last year, uh, in the last year or so, I picked up uh, ladders, um, assorted debris. I got a sofa off of I-10. Uh, just never know what you're going to find out there. Uh, had a dog kennel with a dog in it a few years ago, and a driver came back for their dog. Of course, I was, I was, I'm a dog lover, so I was concerned about the dog's well-being, and uh, they couldn't understand why they were getting a ticket for, for that. But uh, anyway, it's, it's important not to cause issues out there on the highway. Uh, and those issues are caused, you need to be paying attention. Uh, number three, drivers have a decreased margin of safety, which leads them to take risks they might not otherwise take, such as turning left in front of oncoming traffic. You know, this is a big one, especially when it comes to motorcycles. Uh, this is where in my distracted driving presentation, I also like to, I always like to remind you, uh, motorcycle operators have just as much of a right to be on the road as anybody else. Uh, they're operating a machine that's smaller and a little more difficult to see uh, than a regular car, truck, van, SUV. Uh, but it's important that we, that we pay attention and watch for motorcycles while we're out there driving. So that's yet another reason why it's important not to be distracted while we're out there on our, on our highways. So if we look at some of the st statistics, Age group with the greatest proportion of distracted drivers was the under 20 age group. 16% uh, of all drivers younger than 20 involved in fatal crashes were reported to have been distracted while driving. That's according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. It's important to note that this figure, this percentage, is likely underreported because people are going to come out and just say, hey, I, I was driving distracted uh, in most cases. So it, that, that figure is probably a little low. But what I do find in talking to driving age students in, in our driving schools is that they don't get defensive about that. Anytime I, I bring this up and I discuss it with them, uh, I haven't had any instances of, of them becoming defensive and saying, no, it's all our parents who are texting and driving or, or anything like that. They recognize that uh, they're going to be distracted while driving. And, and uh, it's good because that recognition is the first part of eliminating the problem. Drivers who use handheld devices are four times as likely to get in a crash as serious enough to injure themselves, according to the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. Uh, handheld devices generally, definitely create a problem because uh, you have that, that, that visual, that manual, that cognitive all going on. Yet using a cell phone while driving, whether it's handheld or hands-free, can delay a driver's reactions as much as having a blood alcohol concentration at the legal limit, 0 0.08 grams percent, according to a University of Utah study. So there again, with that hands-free component, you don't have the manual, you don't have the visual as much, although as Ron pointed out, uh, these, these aids can be a distraction like the, um, the Uconnect and the, and the different ones that are, that are in vehicles. Uh, you still have to deal with them. They're still a distraction, even if that distraction is not in your phone. But it's that cognitive element that, that's potentially causing an issue behind the wheel. So if we look at Louisiana state law, texting while driving is a violation of Louisiana state law at any age. It doesn't matter how young or old you are, if you're texting while driving, you're breaking the law. And it's important to point out that when we're talking about texting, we're not talking about just in the traditional sense with an instant message. We're also talking about consuming any textual information. In other words, if you're looking at a website or um, if, if it's any other sort of messaging, uh, we'll get into social media in just a moment. If you're, you're sending that or receiving that, an email, for example, uh, that is a uh, violation of Louisiana state law. Accessing social media while driving is a violation of state law at any age. A few years ago, I was driving to Doritter to go give a pre presentation on distracted driving. I, I believe it was for the Lions Club. And uh, I was on my way and I actually passed a woman who was driving fairly slow because she was concentrating on her, on her phone and observed that she was on Facebook while I was going to this meeting. And fortunately for her, I had to get to the meeting early to, to spend a little time with, with the folks there 
uh, before the meeting so that I wouldn't interrupt the actual uh, meeting when it when it commenced. Um, but just to say, uh, you know, I see this sort of thing all the time, and uh, we do take action in most cases when we find it. She just got lucky that day. Uh, using a cell phone in a hands-free school zone is a violation of state law. If uh, you're in a school zone and it's designated as a hands-free zone, which most of these will have a black and white regulatory sign under the speed limit sign that says hands-free zone, uh, then you're a violation of state law. But even if it isn't set up that way, they may have a different design of sign, but as long as it designates that school zone as hands-free, you're in violation if, if you're using any handheld electronic device while you're going through that school zone. And no one under 18 may use a cell phone while driving unless it is an enumerated emergency. This is uh, one that strikes a, a little close to, to home over here because one of the fatal crashes that we dealt with involving a, a younger driver happened on September 28th, 2011. 17 year old Mercedes Garcia is driving on Highway 3059 in Calcasieu Parish. She's talking on a cell phone while she's driving, which is a violation of state law. She runs off the road. She tries to recover, but she can't. She's driving too fast. Our reconstructionist would place her speed at 77 miles an hour at the time of the crash. Her vehicle runs off the road, flips over. Mercedes isn't wearing seatbelt. She's critically injured, flown to a hospital in Houston the very next day where she dies. What makes it even sadder is she was going to an Iowa high school football game to be crowned homecoming queen that evening. Her mother has asked me to share this story uh, whenever I talk to driving age students, and I'm sharing it with you today just so that you know there's a reason why these laws exist. They may not always be convenient, they might not always be fun, but they're designed to save lives. And Mercedes, is a prime example of a life that could have been saved had she only been obeying the law that day. So we'll look at some of the penalties on here. I have here the maximum penalties. I wanna make it clear that the penalty is actually set by the judge. May or may not get the maximum, but I do want you to know what those penalties can entail. For our first violation, uh, for most of the applicable statutes here with one exception, I'll detail that in a moment, uh, first violation is up to a $500 fine. So if you're texting and driving, Facebooking, uh, doing those things you shouldn't be doing, uh, you can be fined up to $500. Sector subsequent violation, up to a $1,000 fine, and potentially up to a 60-day suspension of your driving privileges. The state of Louisiana does get pretty serious about it if you're caught doing these things. And if a person is involved in a crash while illegally using a telecommunications device, then the fine shall be doubled. Uh, that's Louisiana state law. And some people will say, well, how are you going to know that I was on my phone when this crash occurred? I can tell you that if it's a serious injury or fatal crash, there's a good chance we're going to subpoena the records for that phone. And we're going to know as part of our crash investigation. So let's look at the consequences of inattentive driving. Uh, this is a personal consequence. I just added this slide to the presentation yesterday. Uh, this happened to me yesterday. That green truck that you see is my truck. Uh, the driver of that white one-ton Ram dually with the gooseneck trailer and the bobcat on the back decided it'd be a great idea to make a right turn from the left lane into the path of my vehicle. And my truck is an older truck, but I took really good care of it, and I really like my truck. But it's now totaled because this driver was driving inattentively. He was not paying attention. One of the first things he told me when he got out of the vehicle was, I didn't see you. Well, obviously, he's not paying attention in that case. So I'll be in the market for another truck. This is a picture that I took. Uh, on I-10, not the best quality. It was done with a BlackBerry camera. Uh, if you look closely, you can see the scrape marks on that right shoulder. 17-year-old uh, driver of that truck was not paying attention. Caused a five-vehicle crash that sent two people to the hospital. His vehicle rolled over, hence those scrape marks on the shoulder. 
uh, that's the roof scraping on the on the pavement before it flipped back upright. Had someone been in the back of that van, it doesn't look as that bad in the picture, but be, having been there, I can tell you they probably wouldn't be with us here today. So if someone had been sitting there, it, it, it was a, a, a hard blow. But people can and do draw, die from distracted driving. Uh, the driver of this vehicle had run out of gas on a bridge and driver came up behind them, was not paying attention, and that resulted in the death of this driver. So please keep in mind, when you're out there, it's uh, important not to drive distracted. And many of you on this webinar today, uh, just keep in mind the consequences of distracted driving when you're sharing it with other groups or groups that you may be presenting to, uh, the consequences are real. Uh, yes, we have enforcement measures, but our goal is voluntary compliance. And the way we achieve voluntary compliance is through education, which is what Ron alluded to earlier. This slide on here doesn't have anything to do with distracted driving, but I thought it was important to include it because if you are involved in a crash, whether it's a result of a distracted driver, an impaired driver, or uh, whatever the case may be, your best defense in the event of a crash is to have your seatbelt on. So I strongly encourage you to wear your seatbelt at all times. Louisiana state law requires it in all seating positions, day and night. So with that, I will conclude my presentation and I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. And I would like to thank Amber and Destiny for putting this on. Wow, Gordon Anderson. Um, first off, I'm so sorry to hear about the crash yesterday. And, you know, I use my word carefully because it is not an accident. You know, we have gotten away from using that word because what we see out on our roadways are preventable. An accident and, and, and the work itself, you know, cannot be used. They are crashes because they are preventable. And, you know, it really got to me looking at your list of the top forms of distracted driving. I know me being a mom and, you know, that's my number one role, but I am a transportation safety coordinator and so I am often thinking about heavily thinking about driving making sure that I'm following the rules you know because I, I have to lead by example but your number four retrieving items from the back seat or floor being a mom I have kids and I am so guilty of doing that and I've caught myself before and situations where I could have caused a crash. And also, number six, talking with passengers as well. I can't tell you how many times I've turned around the bus with my two boys. Um, and then another thing that got to me, because I see it so much, as like I was talking about earlier, I am such a data geek, and looking at all of our crashes and training them and seeing how many rear ends um, that our state experiences well, when you, when you do some tiered analysis and drop down to it, the number one contributing factor to a rear end is what? Distracted driving. Um, so I just think that that's scary. And, and guys, Sergeant Anderson witnesses the tragedy daily that results from distracted driving. These tragedies range from costing time, money, vehicles as you've just seen, and in its most expensive form, lies. Okay, so I'm gonna give you just a little behind the scenes peek before moving on, but before I get into my next script there, thank you so much, Sergeant Anderson. I hope everyone knows what a wealth of information and knowledge and expertise that you have just witnessed and heard. Um, he has been on the ground seeing this for so long, and he, he is not exaggerating, he is not joking. So take the heart, take the mind, and walk away with the knowledge he has so graciously given us today. All right, so I'm going to give you a little behind-the-scenes peek into the planning that went into today's webinar. 
We knew we had to secure a knockout lineup of panels. But then we were stuck on the order of presentation. And then it just clicked. Again, baggy, problem solving. Problem solving application. Duh. I know how we're going to order. We're going to define the problem. Ron's experience and his knowledge is on point to be first. Oh, yeah, he's going first. Identify the consequences. Who's best to paint a picture of the ugliness that distracted driving can cause? Then our boots on the ground up. Sergeant Anderson, hands cut. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I mean, hands down, he was the one for that one. Develop a solution, a community based solution. <laughs> well, there is not another person on this planet that I would have chosen for this one, our final panelist. Let me welcome and introduce Mr. Scott Fazio, risk and assets with the community coffee company. He is responsible for risk, insurance, safety, fleet, property, and routing management. Over 600 vehicles driving 14 million miles a year and 13 vehicle types. That's a lot of responsibility, guys. Before his role with Community Coffee, Scott served as the Director of Risk and Operations for the St. Charles Parish Public School System, and prior to that, helped root cause and knowledge management positions with multiple offshore entities. Scott has a vast educational background, having attended Holy Cross High School in New Orleans, and going on to earn two BBAs from Mississippi State University in risk management and finance law, and finally obtaining an MBA from St. Leo University in organizational behavior and analysis. Welcome, Mr. Scott Fazio. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And if you could share yours. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so just as uh, the previous presenters talked about, um, the main types of uh, distracted driving are, are the, the visual, the cognitive, and the manual. And I'm going to go into a few different types of that. Um, but hopefully, uh, I'm, I'm going to be able to convey uh, what the practice of uh, trying to mitigate that and manage that from a corporate perspective looks like and how we can promote engagement uh, not only with our, our employees and team members, but um, with our family and then hopefully with the community as well. So at Community for uh, Visual Distraction, we find that 84% uh, of our accidents involve uh, poor following distance. And when you have poor following distance, if you are distracted, obviously you're, you're not going to have much time to uh, react to that. One of the biggest uh, distractions that we find in our company is not cell phones, and I'll get into that in a minute on why it's not, but one of the big, biggest distractions we run into in over 60% um, of our at-fault accidents is uh, stairs. Uh, we find that our drivers were in a blank stair or a fixed stair. A blank stair is uh, equal to just looking off in the distance, you're in a uh, kind of a daydream, not really looking at anything in particular, and a fixed stair is, is the exact opposite of that, where you're focused on something, um, you're trying to read a bumper sticker, uh, read a billboard, um, but you're actually, you're focused on something in particular. Uh, why is this important? Or how, well, first of all, how can we break that up? Uh, we recommend moving your eyes every two seconds. We want you to avoid focusing on anything for more than two seconds. And that's just simply scanning your environment. Um, looking around, you know, batting your eyes around, keeping your brain active, keeping your eyes active. And that's important because uh, we have two types of vision. Your central vision is really what you're focusing on. And then your peripheral vision is the surrounding area uh, that really picks up uh, movement and change, movement and color, movement, color, changes in light, that sort of thing. We call the peripheral vision kind of your early warning system, right? So if you're using your central vision to scan ahead, you're giving yourself a lot of lead time, you're checking out the intersection, the light, car in front of you. Um, your peripheral vision is going to pick up if somebody's merging from the left or the right, running the light, slamming on their brakes, um, coming up behind you, you know, your peripheral vision can pick up the mirror. Um, so your peripheral vision is that early warning system. But if you're in a stair, such as a blank or a fixed stair, your peripheral vision starts to fade. Um, your central vision becomes more focused, and your peripheral vision 
uh, diminishes. And the more it diminishes, the longer it takes for you to react, the longer it takes for you to realize that something has come into your peripheral vision. And if you, uh, as you heard earlier, if, if you're on the highway and you're going highway speed, uh, if it takes you an extra second or two, you could lose 50, 60, 70 yards of time. And that's often not enough time to do anything uh, should somebody be in your way. Another visual distraction is differentiating between what's a relevant and irrelevant object. Right, a relevant object is anything that will affect your path of travel or whose path of travel you may affect. So speed sign, right? That's a relevant object. Construction sign, relevant object. Um, if you're on the overhead expressway, people coming out of Walmart are irrelevant. But if you're turning into the parking lot, they're obviously relevant, right? So billboards, not relevant. Uh, the brand new car sitting out front of the dealership, not relevant, right? We, we want to avoid focusing on anything that's irrelevant. Um, and, and that will help you maintain focus on the things that can affect your path of travel. Obviously, some things that are irrelevant while you're driving is your cell phone, any electronic device. Um, here at Community Coffee, we have a no cell phone or no interaction with an electronic device policy. We have stickers on all of our vehicles that uh, say no cell phone while driving. And there's a phone number under there to where if you see our driver on uh, their cell phone while they're driving, we invite you to call that number and uh, report that driver to us. Uh, that's from the top on down. And if, uh, if you have two instances of being found to be interacting with an electronic device uh, while driving your vehicle with community coffee, uh, we can no longer uh, afford to employ you. So we're very strict with that. And uh, it, it's really served us well. And it's why we do not have uh, instances of our drivers being distracted with a cell phone. Second type of distraction you heard about was a cognitive distraction. And I'm going to dive a little bit into this and into a uh, project I was a part of. Um, and, and we talk about at community, the difference between habit and active engagement. Are you driving out of habit or are you driving with active intent? Are you driving actively engaged? And we do a lot of things out of habit. Sometimes we drive out of habit. I've been guilty of, you know, Sunday, I'm, I go to my mom's every Sunday with my kids and we get in the car back out the driveway, and next thing you know, you're just there, right? You don't remember turning left. You don't remember getting off the interstate. You don't remember it's the third house on the right. You're just there because you do it all the time. Um, when I have supervised here, I supervise route drivers, right? So then when I used to supervise school bus drivers, they're driving the same route, the same roads, the same direction, ways, all the time. And so we need to break that up. We need to make sure that they're not just driving out of habit. Um, and so we ask, are you actively engaged? Are you driving with intent? And we equate this in our new driver orientation with an experiment of, of uh, brain activity in mice. And uh, just bear with me, it'll make sense here in a second. But uh, we had an experiment uh, in college where uh, we hooked electrodes up uh, to a uh, mouse and uh, we were able to read and register that, that mouse's brain activity. And uh, this was part of a larger organization I just, uh, uh, experiment. I just borrowed this section because it, it's applicable to this. But the, the goal was uh, to find out what, what kind of influence um, habit and repetitive activity has on, on brain power, brain activity. So you'll see here, this is just the level of activity in, in a mouse. And you can see the cue, that would be the door opening in a maze. Um, so when we would open the door, Activity would spike, what's going on, let's see what's going on, and the mouse would go forward, and he would come to a decision point. He can go left or right. If he goes left, he hits the wall. If he goes right, he gets to keep going. Comes to another decision point. He can go left or right. If he goes right, he hits the wall. If he goes left, he gets to keep going. And at the end, there was chocolate or cheese or, or something, but there was a reward, and you can see very happy to get that reward, very interested in it. Um, this was the average brain activity for the first couple days. Well, in the last uh, week of the trial, week three and four, this is the brain activity of the mouse. So you can see there's a cue. Okay, it's time to start. I'm going to start go this maze. But it's the same maze every time. So he's doing the maze out of habit. He's not doing the maze with intent. And so the brain activity dramatically decreases. He doesn't need his brain activity to do this because he's able to do it out of habit. So we encourage our drivers do you really want to operate a 20,000 pound truck with the same amount of brain activity you brush your teeth with or the same amount of brain activity you tie your shoes with? 
You know, the things you do out of habit, you can do them, uh, and you've done them a lot because your brain is an amazing thing. But uh, when you get to that point, you're not really using your brain that much. And when you're not actively engaged, you're not driving with intent, uh, bad things can happen, and you can easily become distracted. One thing that can contribute to that cognitive distraction is decision fatigue, which is a, a kind of a new and emerging science the past 20 years. But um, as we become more dependent on um, interactions with people and computers and less in the industrial side of the world, um, you make more decisions than you do actual physical activity. And uh, that's why a lot of executives you'll see, Mark Cuban does this, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, the guy from Facebook, um, they'll wear the same clothes every day, right? They got a closet full of the same 10 shirts, the same 10 shorts, same 10 jeans, same 10 shoes, whatever. Because it's one less decision they have to make. And you can think about how many decisions you have to make during a day. Now imagine those decisions are also being made while you're driving a 20,000 pound truck at 70 miles an hour. So we want to give our drivers as few non-essential decisions as possible. But we try to do as much prep as we can for them, right? We pre-program their GPS. We give them a, a list of who to see and, uh, you know, a memory of, of or documentation of, you know, what this person likes or what the traffic's like on this day or whatever we can do. You know, we want to load the truck for them. We want to do as much as we can to help them out to where their decisions and their, their focus can be on actually driving the vehicle. Physical fatigue is a big one, obviously, you know, um, we want to make sure we stay hydrated, we stay fed, um, but being physically fatigued, your body's expending energy to keep yourself awake and keep yourself active. Um, that energy is, is taken away from your brain. Your brain burns a ton of calories. And so if uh, you're spending all your energy trying to keep yourself moving, that's less energy for your brain. Mental fatigue is a big one too. The biggest impact on this is stress. Um, we see this a lot. We do a lot of driver debriefs where we you know, sit with them um, immediately after the accident, 24 hours after, 48 hours after, a week after, and 30 days after. And we get them to just tell us the accident again so we can just document it. And um, our most common phrase that we find is, I was rushing, I was stressed. And it really boils down to just, man, it, it, you're worn out mentally. And that can definitely add to a cognitive distraction. Um, some kind of minor impairment on cognitive, cognitive distraction level will delay your function by two times the normal. Significant can delay by 6x. Cell phone use increases cognitive distraction by 10x. Texting by 15x. Um, and what this impacts, the, the distraction and the delay, is uh, has to do with something called an OODA loop, O-O-D-A, stands to observe, orient, decide, and act. And this is something that the uh, U.S. Air Force developed. Um, you have to observe your environment, orient yourself within that environment, decide what to do, and then act, right? And hopefully, you're doing this constantly. Hopefully, you're constantly observing, you're moving your eyes every two seconds, you know where you are on the road, you know what you can do with the vehicle, to where if something were to happen, uh, you can quickly decide, or you've already decided what you're going to do should something hypothetical happen. When it occurs, all you have to do is act, right? Because you're constantly in that loop of observing, orienting, deciding, and act. When you're distracted, you're going to take longer to make the wrong decision. Because if you're fatigued, it's taking you longer to observe. It takes you longer to observe uh, because you're not actively observing. Um, you're going to not be able to orient yourself. And by the time you do that, now you got to decide what to do. And because you're doing that without proper observation and orientation, you're more likely to make the wrong action or wrong decision. So here's an example of that, right? Um, you observe, you hear a siren, you determine that the sound's coming from behind you, you decide you got to make room for the ambulance, so you have to pull over and act. Um, this is a cycle we go through, and hopefully you go through it very quickly, um, but at any point, if you're doing anything that delays your ability to observe, orient, and decide, that action is going to take that much longer to happen. As I said, manual distraction, we are having no cell phone policy here at Community Coffee. We do not allow you to interact with any electronic device while operating the vehicle. We talked earlier about eating and drinking, smoking, doing your makeup, uh, riding, even being uncomfortable. If you're fidgeting, searching for something, trying to adjust the seat. Um, and of course, as, as the panelists mentioned earlier, cell phone creates all three types of distraction, manual, cognitive, and physical. Okay, so let's say we're, trying, we're doing the best we can but we end up being distracted, right? How can we mitigate the impact of our so-called inevitable distraction? 
Well, best thing you can do is have proper following distance. We recommend four seconds of proper following distance between you and the vehicle in front of you in perfect conditions. And obviously, as the road conditions deteriorate or if you're driving with a heavy load behind you, you want to increase that following distance. We want to anticipate the actions of others, right? So as you're scanning and keeping that active eye movement, you notice the car in front of you that the bumper is all messed up or the car to the left of you has a missing mirror or the person on the right of you is eating a bowl of ramen, right? So can we be aware and maybe try to anticipate where we shouldn't be? Can we anticipate based on the direction of somebody's tire or if they're distracted, what they may or may not see? Um, one, it helps you continue to scan, but two, it gets you through that observation. It gets you through the orientating process. You can now decide, okay, if this happens, here's what I'm gonna do. So all you have to do is that. You wanna leave yourself an out as the Smith driving system would do. It's, it's easier said than done, as you can see by this picture. But you always want to have a place where you can put the vehicle should the worst happen, right? And if you're driving on a one way each way, if the ditch is on the right, um, you know, are you watching for how, how deep the ditch is? Is it full of water? Um, how far in between poles to where if somebody crosses that center line and I got to swerve to the right, what am I going to be in for, right? So just that constant brain activity, that constant engagement in the situation can definitely help you out should you become distracted. It's important to recognize what, what causes the problem, right? What causes you to be dis distracted? What causes you to be fatigued? What causes you to be less engaged? Um, we found that when uh, we, we have uh, 32, 33% of our accidents occur after 2 p.m. What's causing that? Um, often we find that it's our drivers being dehydrated and they haven't eaten. Um, they haven't eaten enough. One of those little things that, you know, you're dehydrated, so now your body's putting an extra effort to keep you uh, functioning and to keep your muscles from seizing up and to keep you from having cramps or um, you're fighting all that off you're unable to, to, to be aware of what's going on so staying hydrated staying fed and getting plenty of sleep um, we recommend a minimum of eight hours and we reach out to our employees and let them know say hey if you're not in a good state of mind if you had a bad night last night if you can't get the job done safely today don't hesitate call us safety before schedule and that's really a value that that we impart to our employees and that, that really means it. We, we really do mean it from, uh, from the top down, right? The values are important, but what's the difference between the people at home office and the ivory towers and the corporate office saying it and proselytizing out, hey, safety before schedule, yada, 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 right? It sounds great. But how do you get the employees engaged? Well, one, you make it one of your values. So safety is one of our values, one of our five values. And uh, everybody's performance review has a safety component. Your bonuses are tied to it, your raises are tied to it, but you can sell all the coffee you want. But if you weren't acting safely, if your behaviors weren't safe, not just how many accidents did you have, but behavior-based safety analysis. We, you know, other pe your peers watch you. We, we watch video. We, we quiz you. We take tests um, on, on, you know, different topics around safety. And if you're not all in for that, it can impact you negatively financially with us. Um, but how do you get that message down? Because some guys are going to say, okay, well, you know, 20% of my bonus or 20% of my raise or, you know, I'll just, I'll just phone it in and I'll get, you know, just enough to pass or, or things like that. How do you get that downstream action? Well, it's important for us that me and my team and even our executive team here can relate to who we call David the driver, right? Your everyday driver. Um, the, the guy that's on the road out there at, from 3 a.m. to 10 a.m., you know, hitting the back of Walmart, dropping off coffee. So in my department, uh, I have 18 people in my department, every single one of them have to get on a truck and deliver coffee uh, five times a year. Mandatory, part of the job. Our CFO gets on a truck, our CEO gets on a truck and make sure that we don't forget what it's like to be in that position. And so it takes the message and it demonstrates that, hey, this is an action. We're coming down there. We're going to ride around. If we put, uh, you know, drive cam cameras or dash cam cameras in our employees' vehicles, I got one in my personal vehicle because I'm not just saying this. It's something that we want to live and we want to put value in. And we found that over the years, if you give drivers, if you give employees three things, autonomy, mastery, and purpose, they tend to be engaged and it, it tends to give a higher percentage chance that they're engaged. So what does that mean, autonomy? I don't want to look over your shoulder. I don't want to be nitpicking every little thing. I want you to own your job. I want you to own your route, own your truck. 
Um, I want you to give you the ability to, to do what you need to do on your own to run your business, to own your business. Mastery. I want to set some KPIs for you, some key performance indicators to say, hey, the best drivers in the world, this is what they do. Here's, you know, here's their accident frequency. Here's their hard braking frequency. Here's their idling frequency. Um, you know, here's their stop adherence. I want to give you something to get better at. I'm not going to knock you if you're not doing it. Right? I'm not going to be punitive, but I'm going to give you these goals to where if you want to get better at it, I'm going to let you get better at it. And purpose. I want you to do this for a reason other than money. So whether it's peer recognition, whether it's just you know self-esteem, feeling good about yourself that you got better at something, um, or whether it's just, hey, I want to drive safely because I want to make it home. And, and, and that's important to me to just be safe and to, to be a good example for others. So we find that if, if we can impart those three uh, tenets of autonomy, mastery, and purpose, uh, it drives engagement. A big thing that I learned offshore is, you know, what are you really solving for? Do you want a lower accident rate? Do you want to lower cost as a percent of sales? Can you really make sure you're trying to mitigate or you're trying to address the actual cause or are you trying to just mitigate a symptom, right? And, and a way we can do this is the five whys. Um, whenever we come up with a problem or we're faced with a problem, I challenge my team to ask why five times, right? You ask why, you get an answer, and you ask why again to really drill down to it. And an example we had here recently was uh, we noticed that our drivers in some Ford SUVs had almost double the idle time of some drivers in our Chevy SUVs. And so we said, oh, what's, what's going on here, right? So we asked one of the drivers, hey, why are you idling so much? Oh, because I got to charge my iPad. Okay, well, why do you have to charge your iPad? Oh, because the battery dies uh, halfway through the day. So we started thinking, okay, well, why does the battery die halfway through the day? Oh, well, the Ford SUVs, the cigarette lighter doesn't stay active unless the engine is on, whereas in the Chevy, it does. You can plug it in, go inside the account, and leave your iPad charging. Okay, well, is that really the root cause of, of why they're idling? No, the root cause of why they're idling is still why is their iPad dying, right? So then we asked our IT department, why are these iPads dying? Well, it turns out the factory setting on the iPads is to have the screen at 100% brightness. Well, the screen at 100% brightness drains the battery. So we found out that our guys are idling more than they should because the factory setting on the iPad has the screen at 100% brightness. And that kind of continued digging allows you to really make action against the actual cause and not just the symptom. And the last part about that is you want to make sure you incentivize something correctly and don't disincentivize something else. Uh, when I was offshore, they had a program for one of the companies where the rig manager would get a $50,000 bonus if they went the entire year without a recordable incident. And you can be sure that they went the entire year without a recordable incident. People got hurt, um, but the rig manager would just take them aside, put them in the mess hall and say, hey, you sit up right here. You play some PlayStation. I'm going to pay you your full pay. And when you get home, you just, uh, you know, you, you tripped on the stairs, I guess is what happened. That's how you broke your ankle. You didn't do it out here. You tripped on the stairs. Um, so, you know, we were incentivizing. The company was incentivizing uh Zero accidents. That's what they want. They want to make sure there's no recordable accidents. Well, then that incentivizes people to make sure that nothing gets recorded. So it's really important to look at, hey, what, what, what are we really solving for here? Well, we don't want people to get hurt. Okay, that's great. Then provide them with the proper training, the proper tools. Tell them why they shouldn't want to get hurt and what happens and how hurt they can get. And then what happens after they get hurt? How does that impact other people? Can you develop a way to make them commit to it instead of just being compliant. Um, we really want to get to the level of we have commitment from our team to accomplish X, Y, Z instead of them just being compliant. And I really think that's, that's helped us a lot. And then I always like to put this up. Um, I always ask why five times. So I have a couple of videos here I want to show. Um, and they're, these are in our, our vehicles here at Community Coffee. Uh, we have... Uh, this vehicle here, is, it has a drive cam system where uh, half the video is in the cab and the other half is out the, out the dash here. So this guy is going to light up a cigarette. Um, he's going 32 miles an hour. 
And as he does that, he looks down, traffic in front of him stops, and he has to do some hard braking, which is what triggers the recording. Oh, let me see. There you go. We can watch him like this. So you can see he goes from 32 miles an hour down to 10, 9. That hard braking right there is what triggers the camera to save that event. But, I mean, just that easily, um, you know, he's distracted from lighting a cigarette, which is against company policy as well. So you can see all the boxes fall through in the back. Uh, not something we like to see. Here's a driver. This is what we call a blank stare. He's just staring out into, into nothingness. Um, he's going to run a red light. Light's going to change. Not really paying attention. His peripheral vision picks it up. Almost T-bones an 18-wheeler. I had to turn the volume off because he has a uh, few choice words there. Here's another driver on a blank stare. Uh, the light is going to be red for eight seconds the entire time of this video, but he doesn't see it until he gets right up on it because his peripheral vision is so diminished, it's an extremely delayed reaction. Light is red. Light is red. He hasn't slowed down. Now he sees it. You can see his reaction on his face. His peripheral vision from that blank stare was so diminished, he's not seeing it until, call that 15 feet away from the light, and he ends up running the light. Here's a relevant versus irrelevant object. Driver's looking out to the right. It's just a parking lot. There's nothing relevant out there, I can promise you. It's not going to affect his path of travel. Now he's got to swerve. Uh, you'll notice, right, he had to observe, orient, decide, and act, right? Well, he didn't have a chance to observe. He didn't have a chance to orient. He just swerves to the left. And luckily, nobody was there. But we don't want to operate out of habit, and we certainly don't want to operate out of luck. Notice he looks right after he turns. Decision was already made. So we got lucky on that one. Finally, cell phone, unfortunately. Um, trying to hide it from the camera there. But you can see looking down. Real close. And he's upset because he know he got caught. And that's not going to do well for him. So uh, I'll just put this up here. Thank you, uh, uh, Destiny and Amber there have my number. I apologize. I have a, a 3 p.m. meeting that I'm late for. I'm going to have to hop off and go uh, attend that. But I'd be happy to share my presentation. I have different versions of this and much longer versions with more videos and such. So if you'd like a presentation at your office with your group, I'd be happy to volunteer uh, my time and come host a, a seminar or a training session on uh, any, any topics you might, uh, you might like. But thank you very much. All right, everyone, if you'll just sit tight, just a few more things before we close up shop. Scott, we can't thank you enough. Um, I hope all of you out there will walk away with some job promoting ideas to bring to your agency for combating distracted and unsafe driving. And keep in mind, you can get your regional coordinator to assist in customizing an employee safe driving policy. Um, there are many things in our world today, guys, that we just can't control. We all know that. But ending up in a car crash because we were driving distracted is not one of those things. Distracted driving has become an addiction on our roadways and a deadly one at best. If you don't remember anything else from today, please remember that. Today, all of you have had a rare opportunity of hearing from a panel of subject matter experts with a, a combined expertise knowledge base of over 90 years. I think they just may know a little something. And as in the beginning of this, we were talking about how to find the Regional Safety Coalition nearest you. I think that was about approximately 5,222 seconds ago that I told you that. But, well, here it is. This map has the contact information of each of your regional safety transportation coordinators. And this map with this information will be available once the webinar has concluded and been uploaded to destinationzerodesk.com. And on this website, you can also find links um, to all kinds of transportation safety resources, 
and your regional safety coalition. All right, and here we are. This is our final slide. I want to thank everyone who participated today in Cross Fingers. I hope you enjoyed your time with us and got something out of it. Thank you to our panelists and all who have helped put this together. All participants will be receiving a certificate of completion. If you registered as a group, we will need the individual names of those in your watch party to ensure all receive their credit. You can either email Destiny or I, our contact information is shown here. Important note, please hang online for a minute or so more to complete the pop-up post-webinar survey, or you can also fill it out once an email is sent to you. Um, so if you register, you will be getting that email with a link for the post-webinar survey. I'll leave everyone with one last thought. The pavement belongs to the roadway. And guys, you can be very unforgiving. So don't make that pavement your own asphalt by driving distracted. Thank you to all the safe drivers out there. And that concludes our webinar for today.